feed me. Feed you what? Come on, give me some can't food. Can't feed you anymore. I'm starving here. <laughs> I want some food. I can't feed, feed you me. anymore. There, there's feed nothing me. more. I want some I chow. I can feed you. I'm ready to <laughs> eat. Nothing. Feed me. There's <laughs> nothing. Oh, hi there, plant fans. Uh, just a moment. Today, we're talking about a serious classic of the horror film genre. One of my favorite horror films of the 1960s, that being Roger Corman's classic 1960 Little Shop of Horrors, the original. Not the 1986 remake, that's right. Today, we're talking about the original from 1960. I mentioned this in my review of his movie Gas, but Roger Corman is one of those filmmakers who continues to surprise me. I mean, the guy is still alive. He was born in the 20s. He's from Detroit, which as far as, far as cities go, isn't... A uh, crazy, you know, movie producing t city. You know, sure, they have Detroiters with Tim Robinson, but Tim Robinson sucks, is my point. So it's nice to know that a film legend like Roger Corman isn't from New York or LA because that would be boring. Roger Corman has a success story unlike any other. He really just rose from the bottom to the top. He he is genuinely what I would refer to as a filmmaker who did it all by himself. I mean, he just ran the gamut. He, he has been producing movies for like, what, 70 years at this point? It is absolutely like mind-blowing just the extent to which this guy is still producing and directing movies. And he's a huge inspiration for me in case you haven't been able to tell. I mean, there is just something so admirable about creating a low-budget, like, lo-fi movie. And Roger Corman was doing all this back in 1960. I like his Poe movies. I really do. And they're definitely the best Edgar Allan Poe adaptations that are probably ever going to be made. But Little Shop of Horrors, I feel, is the film where Roger Corman really comes into his own. You have elements in Little Shop of Horrors that will become staples of Corman's work later on, such as uh, a universe that feels really well-defined, and you feel like there are stories to be told in this universe besides the story being told to you, the viewer, even though the idea of a Roger Cor Corman multiverse isn't really ever implied. Uh, B, a surreal premise that almost borders on being avant-garde, just how weird the premise is. I want food! A talking plant we got. I'm hungry! No. Hungry? And not a fine kettle from fish. And three, really, really good acting. Like, I'm talking like some believable acting. Like, you buy it completely. And maybe it's just because, you know, you've already bought into this insane premise that makes absolutely no sense, so, you know, the acting just kind of follows. But I think what's impressive about Roger Corman's movies, uh, not his Poe ones, but his, you know, more modern contemporary ones is that he has casts of like nobodies that are not in any other movies but they're just so good they're just such good actors and it's like where does he come up with all these people you know uh the guy who plays seymour in the original little shop of horrors the guy who plays seymour has his wikipedia page is like two inches of text and it just says he, he works exclusively in Roger Corman movies. It's like he's so talented. How'd Roger Corman find this guy? And how's this movie so much better than it has any right to be? I'm sorry, pal. I'm fresh out of blood. Talk to somebody else. <laughs> this movie has so many flaws. Like, you can see the felt when the Audrey Jr. plant is little. You can It's very obvious when it gets big that... 
the plant is the the bulbs on the plant are just like paper and the faces on the plant just do not look convincing they look like you know just roger corman had someone who is kind of good at sketching things out and he's like going there with the buds and i mean it, it doesn't even look like the people it's supposed to be you also have like the outside of mushnik's flower shop is obviously just a set like there's no street outside Mushnik's flower shop. It's just a, a painting of a building. It's like a matte painting of a building. You also have a lot of continuity errors and this bizarre introduction of these like dragnet parody detectives that their only role in the film is to narrate it. And one of them's like, I'm a, I'm, my name's Joe Fink. I'm a Fink. Clothes? Blood in office. Where? Skid Row. Ideas? None. Check it out. Yeah. It just gets so weird, and it borders on being like, just uh, it borders on being like bizarre. But through it all, you you keep in mind, oh, there is a plot here. But but the movie is set in in such a skewed version of reality, and this is because it was done on a really low budget. Mushnik's flower shop looks so cheap, and that works because it's supposed to be a cheap flower shop that's run down. You know, it, 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 it's really, really cheap. You just got painted signs with this broken English, and everything looks like a set. And it's kind of like a stage play. It's kind of like a streetcar named Desire or something, and that most of the action takes place in the one flower shop. And there are some secondary sets. There's Seymour's house, and there's also the dentist's office, and also the restaurant. But the restaurant, I think, is just a, a house, because there's like a dresser against one of the walls, and the same goes for the dentist's office. The, the dentist rig looks pretty convincing, and they got some interesting equipment and everything, but really, to make a convincing dentist waiting room, all you really need is just a room some chairs and some magazines and Roger Corman pulls it off. I mean, the sets are convincing. If you just suspend your disbelief and remember that it's like a really low budget movie, but it's from 1960, so you don't even care. The fact that this movie is from 1960 and that Roger Corman is just doing all this stuff because he's a mad genius and he has a cool idea and wants to get it out there is enough to convince you of anything. Feed me! So the original Little Shop of Horrors is absolutely incredible and you have so many fun characters that are so well developed and you feel like they could easily be in their own movie. Like the guy who eats flowers. What's his deal? Oh, here are your carnations. Wait, I'll wrap them for you. No, that's you. all right. I'll eat them here. Why not? Of course. What else? They are all right. Well, I've had better. Or the the president of the Society of Silent Flower Watchers. What the heck is her deal? Ah. You like? I neither like nor dislike anything, my goodness. I happen to represent the Society of Silent Flower Observers of Southern California. How about that? Just these very well-developed, really well-thought-out characters. Everyone feels like they live in this universe of Skid Row, which is just this, like, run-down back-alley sleaze joint. And I think this movie is very interesting in that it tackles the conditions of those in the slums, which is a story you don't hear much back in 1960. And I think it's populated with some really, really interesting characters, all kinds of cool little witty lines of dialogue tossed in there, because Roger Corman knows that there really aren't that many interesting set pieces besides the Audrey Jr., which also, you know, you can tell that it's just like cotton and and fabric. But, you know, the Audrey Jr. is obviously the main highlight, and it does look good, especially when it gets big. Roger Corman understands that the movie 
looks really cheap, so he needs to he needs to balance that out by giving the characters stuff to do. The characters have so many lines, and they and they all have their own little bits, and it's just great how the characters interact, and you feel like this universe is just completely developed. Like you feel like you're listening to this candid conversation from like what is it at this point, like 60 years ago? And then the shots that aren't uh, in either of the three primary sets, Seymour's house, uh, Mushnik flower shop, or the dentist's office, are in really cool locations that give a fascinating glimpse into like 1960s urban life. You have the railroad yards, you have uh, the tire factory, which is just such a cool spot for a climax. You got all these, you know, you got Seymour, and he's being chased by the two cops and Mr. Mushnick, and they're climbing over these tires. It's just such a surreal image, and I'm surprised that it hasn't worked its way into the public consciousness, like the swamps in Psycho, or, you know, the stuff in Blue Velvet, or it's just such a surreal image, you know. You'd think, you'd think that David Lynch fans would take note, because it's really just a cool image. And to think that Roger Corman probably just paid this tire factory like five bucks to come in and film on these tires. Or maybe even nothing, who knows. It's just absolutely fascinating. And you got these shots of Seymour just walking around. And, you know, some of them, I mean, I assume they just got a camera out there and just started filming. Which is absolutely the way to go in making a movie. Because that way you don't need to pay it. For a big set, you just make the city your set, and it works. And it looks so it looks so good. It looks very convincing. When Seymour is walking around, it, you, you just feel like, man, this is the 60s, you know? This is the side of reality that the more big-budget movies of the era weren't willing to show anyone. You know, these run-down buildings, all this, all this decrepit architecture, it really shows how America actually was at that time. It's America told from the point of view of the everyman. So I just think Little Shop of Horrors is a very important movie. Most people will point to Jack Nicholson being in this. I will say he's pretty good, and for the, like, six minutes of screen time he gets in this, you can definitely see the beginning of a promising career. There were other complications. <laughs> the man had cancer, tuberculosis, leprosy, and a touch of the grip. I will say, however, that if you try and watch this movie only looking for him, you probably won't even notice him. He's so young in this. He's like 15 years before One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He's like seriously young. So you, I mean, he has that Jack Nicholson smile and that Jack Nicholson, like, uh, you know, kind of mannerisms, but his voice is like this prepubescent, like, he sounds like he's five, and his, like, gravelly, sinister tone hasn't really developed yet. So you're like, is that Jack Nicholson, or is that just someone doing a Jack Nicholson impression, or what? It's gonna hurt you more than it is me. Oh, goody, goody, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> You should not spend the entire movie just waiting for Jack Nicholson because everyone brings the heat. I mean, Seymour's good, Audrey's good, Mushnick's good, the, the two high school girls are great. Everyone in this movie is so powerful a screen presence that it's just like, whoa, you know, how the heck... None of these people, you know, get big, huge careers after this because their acting is just so good. And that's unfortunately how the times were back in 1960. I mean, we're talking pre-VHS. There's no way to distribute this movie except in theaters. And, you know, Roger Corman, this was released by, through his own company rather than American International. It was released through his own company, so it didn't get the attention it deserves. And that is a real shame, because this movie is so good. Uh, it's in black and white, but that doesn't even matter. I mean, some Roger Corman movies are fine, 
or you know they're they're good in color but i don't think little shop of horrors would be good in color partially because more detail would only draw more attention to how fake everything is and all the sets and everything and i think the black and white really lends itself to this kind of story because everything is greasy and grimy and it, it's like a film war is what it's trying to kind of spoof uh, especially with the with the dragnet guys So I think it doesn't work in color, and you shouldn't worry about that. And if you if if you don't like old movies, check Little Shop of Horrors out. It's so good you won't even notice you're watching anything old. It's like it's like the characters are so funny. Every line of dialogue is just a laugh riot. Like how Mr. Mushnick mispronounces everything. What am I? Or how, how the guy eating the flour is like, uh, this This would probably be indigestible. It's just so funny. Every character is just a, a hoot. I mean, this movie is one of the funniest horror movies. And really, it's, it's more a comedy than scary. You're not going to be scared watching this, but that's not the point. The point is just to have fun with this crazy story about a plant that eats people. I mean, only Roger Corman could pull this off because only he has the determination and, you know, willingness to put a story this insane uh, in, in movie form. And it really, really checks out. I mean, everything about this movie is classic. And I am honestly surprised that this movie hasn't gotten all the praise it deserves because killer plants are an underrated, you know, thing. I mean, as they say on Reddit, Nature is metal, and I can agree with that as far as plants go. There are tons of killer plants out there who eat insects by the dozen. I've owned a Venus flytrap, and let me tell you, that thing is sentient. It, it will sense a fly, and the fly will go in, and it just chomps down. You know, everyone says it's just reflexes. I don't buy that. I think a Venus flytrap legitimately senses that there's a tasty snack in there. You got Venus flytraps, obviously, you got the pitcher plant, so many different species of plant that kill things. So I think the idea of that in a horror movie is just honestly, like, brilliant. And I think Little Shop of Horrors could have actually worked with a more serious tone, because, you know, it is kind of scary to think of a plant that, you know, takes its vengeance out on the animal kingdom by, you know, digesting all these people but it's played like so funny and it's just great. The end result is absolutely not something I would, I would ever consider changing. It's, uh, it's such a perfect recipe for success. So now, unfortunately, it's time to mention the 1986 movie based on the musical that stole this movie's thunder and had no right to. Any time, you know, Broadway musicals are brought up, you got a few that are always brought up. You got Chicago, you got, um, whatever, you know, you, you, got, uh, you got, you got Chicago, I, you got Hamilton, I haven't been to Broadway, I don't know any musicals, but one that always gets brought up whenever musicals are brought up is Little Shop of Horrors which makes no sense because Little Shop of Horrors, there is nothing about the movie that would even remotely lend itself to a musical. It's a perfect movie as it is. Nobody needed to make songs about it and, and make a, you know, a ton of songs about it. I don't care how catchy the songs are. It just was not necessary. Now, this isn't the same as with, like, a movie, a really bad movie, like Reefer Madness. That was turned into a musical, and this makes sense, because it's a really bad movie, and it really sucks, and to see it turned into a musical and have these funny songs in it is funny, because Reefer Madness is a shitty movie that nobody liked, so adding songs in it can really add some entertainment value. But Little Shop of Horrors is made by Roger Corman, like the king of pop cinema, like the ultimate creator of horror, 
And, like, why would you... Who could improve upon a movie that's so perfect as its own product, its own thing? And Roger Corman had no input on the musical or the, or the 86 movie. It just makes no sense. Why, why turn it into a musical? Now, the movie has so many celebrities who would, you know, normally in a movie I'd be like, yeah, this movie is just a giant waste of their talent. You got Steve Martin, Rick Moranis, Jim Belushi, John Candy, all in the same movie, and none of it works because they're just wasted on this musical that has no reason to exist. It's completely uninspired. Rick Moranis is Seymour, which doesn't even make any sense, because Seymour is not a nerd character in the original, like at all. Like he's he's not a he's not Charles Atlas or anything, but he's not like a Rick Moranis type character. So this just makes no sense. Bill Murray is now the masochist in the dentist's office instead of Jack Nicholson. Makes no sense. I can't even imagine Bill Murray as a masochist, much less giving it the kind of fervent energy that Jack Nicholson... I mean, he's just so perfect as this masochist who loves, who loves pain. It's so perfect. Why put Bill Murray in there? This seems as unnecessary a choice as making Bill Murray into Garfield. Like, it just makes no sense. You have, the, on the one hand, this movie filled with complete unknowns who are like in no other movies. I think, I think the girl who plays Audrey is in Gremlins. That's about it. And they're hilarious and so talented. And you think, man, this is like a, a, a tour de force of acting. Sing, oh, you're trying to kill me. A duel, aha. <laughs> yeah, on the one hand, you have this film of complete unknowns. And on the other hand, you have a movie with Steve Martin and John Candy and Rick Moranis and Bill Murray that manages to have no comedic potential whatsoever. It's not funny, and it's not scary, and it's not a fun time. You don't know what you're messing with. Steve Martin plays the dentist. And in this version, he's Audrey's abusive boyfriend. Makes no sense. Because Audrey's suppo Seymour's supposed to be Audrey's boyfriend. Why you gotta add in this complex love triangle? But also, I get Steve Martin's dentist character mixed up with his character in Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. You know, Dr. Maxwell Edison with the silver hammer. <laughs> And then to top this all off, he also plays the dentist in Novocaine with Helena Bonham Carter. Can I ask you something? Ever do it in the chair? Ever do it, ever do it in the chair? So it's just a big, confusing, mind-blowing mess. All these doctor slash dentist characters Steve Martin plays, it's like enough already. King Tut's funny, but like all these all these dentist characters, like, you know, I don't like his banjo career. I think he's much, much better a comedian than a banjo player, but my gosh, he has nothing to do in this. And he just sings about how he likes causing people pain. And like the dentist in the original gets some lines, but he's not, he's not really a, a, a character. Like, yeah, like I said, all the characters in the original are really fleshed out, and they really are given a lot to do, but you, you watch it for Jack Nicholson as this funny masochist, you know, because he, he has such a more... Pre Why make the dentist a main character? Because the idea is, you know, it's, it's established that he's working in, on Skid Row in the slums, and his budget is kind of low, but the the main humor comes from the masochist who you know enjoys these this low quality din, uh, dentistry because it's so crappy and he doesn't get novocaine or anything I don't like 
to go to the dentist, but I rather enjoy it myself, don't you? <laughs> I mean, there's such, there's a real feeling of growth, of, of <laughs> progress when that, that old drill goes in. So, to make the dentist a, a, like a main character, much less Audrey's boyfriend, just makes absolutely no sense. And to top it all off, you, you have this, like, there's two endings. One where Seymour and Audrey get married, and then the original ending where Audrey Jr. takes over the whole United States and climbs on the Statue of Liberty. And both endings just suck because the only ending that works is the one in the original movie. The ending where Seymour sacrifices himself to the plant and gets eaten by the plant and then, you know, he turns into a blossom. That's the ending that makes sense, because after he kills all these people, the only, you know, he, he, he realizes that he's a scummy person, and he has to sacrifice himself. It's a noble sacrifice. This is the storyline that makes actual sense. I'll feed you like you've never been fed before. Audrey Jr. takes over the entire world. It's just the, the lamest ending. And it it is absolutely not something Roger Corman would go with. It's just too lame. It, it, it has none of the character pathos that Little Shop of Horrors did. And I think what some people don't understand is that Little Shop of Horrors is not like The Blob or Creature from the Black Lagoon. It's not like trashy it it has a vision and it's you know it has this really tight script that it really sets out on and all the characters and the whole ex you know the whole dialogue and everything is set out to to follow this story to its logical conclusion i, I think some people don't get this it's not just a b movie it actually it's a movie that actually tries like sure it's a b movie and it's, it's cheesy and fun, but it's also Roger Corman, and he knows how to make a movie, like a really good movie if he really tries. And Little Shop of Horrors, the original, is good because it's, it's a fun story with fun characters that are likable that you can get behind that go through this incredible progression of events with this very set script, this really, really tight script, and all these funny jokes thrown in, and there's just so many jokes and funny moments, like, you know, Seymour is, you know, he's, she's like, what's this kind of sandwich? And Audrey's like, it's a peanut butter and jelly, it's just food. And he's like, isn't it supposed to cure, cure me or something? Because he's grown up with his hypochondriac mother. Uh, well, I'm a ventriloquist. You're what? A ventriloquist. Feed me! Seymour, do you feel all right? Or we, when it's like, uh, you know, music for invalids on the radio, or the world is just tailored to be as funny as possible at every conceivable moment. And then you have, you toss songs in there. And I get off on the pain I inflict. You don't need songs. It's a funny movie with funny jokes. And that is really just all you need. That, that's all you, you need. You don't need all these songs. And I don't care if they're like, you know, catchy or they're Motown or whatever. I mean, okay, the Dennis song is kind of catchy. It's, it's nothing amazing. And when I see like, you know, Steve Martin going around being like, I like causing people pain, I think, man, this sure would be better if Jack Nicholson was in this, because He's funny and and a good actor and he's awesome. Even though he's in for only like six m minutes, it's practically a cameo. Wilbur Force is such a better character than Orin Scrivello, which is w what Steve Martin's dentist character is named. It's just like, why'd you hire Steve Martin for this? Why'd you have to ruin him? It's worse than Dr. Maxwell and the flipping. Sergeant Pepper movie. Why? Why? What a world, what a world, what a world, what a world. I get off on the pain I inflict. 
but that said, you know, I think the musical has just overshadowed the movie in the pop in the popular consciousness to an obscene extent. You search Little Shop of Horrors up on Google and the remake comes up instead of the original. And it's like, why? Like, if you, do you ever see this when a remake comes up in Google results instead of the original? Like, if you search up Friday the 13th, Google doesn't assume you're talking about the remake version. If you search up any movie, it doesn't just give you the remake, it gives you the original, because usually remakes are, like, not that great. And Little Shop of Horrors, sadly, is not an exception to that rule. The Little Shop of Horrors remake is so bad, even if it's supposedly based on this musical that was around before it. And I have nothing against musicals. It's just the Little Shop of Horrors does not need to be a musical. It's not designed to have songs in it. It's designed to be 70 minutes of plant-eating fun, or plant-eating man fun, or also plant-eating fun, because there's the guy who eats the plants. Look, don't knock it until you try it, huh? It's designed to be 70 minutes of fun and jokes like every five seconds, and you can't fit all these hilarious zingers in if you're too concerned with cause I'm a dentist and I'm a success and it's just oh my gosh they ruined Roger Corman it's like if you made a musical of Death Race 2000 it would be shit cause Death Race 2000 isn't designed to be a musical the Rocky Horror Picture Show another horror musical absolutely that's designed to be a musical it was a musical before it was a movie, and it's designed to have songs interwoven throughout. And the songs are good because they're, you know, planned to fit with the plot instead of just hashed together and dropped in here. Oh, let's make a song about Mr. Mushnick. Uh, you know, he's he's uh, old and, and crabby and he... And he mispronounces things. We can put that in the song. It's like, no, don't. Just leave, just leave Mr. Mushnick alone and just watch the goddamn Roger Corman version. Why does everyone think that the remake is this incredible, oh my god, it's made, I can't get enough of this up, Aubrey Jr. So you may not understand this, but what makes the original Little Shop of Horrors such a monumental film in terms of horror history is that it it was filmed on a really low budget, like $20,000, and it doesn't even look like that. Most of it probably went towards the plants in Mushnick's flower shop. That's probably the extent to which the budget went. But through the use of creative framing and these really nice shots, and a really great script, and really talented actors, Roger Corman was able to take this tiny budget and make it into a movie that wowed millions with its innovative premise and fun storyline. And then the remake is bloated and has this giant budget. And it was filmed on the Albert Broccoli soundstage. The same soundstage they used to make flipping James Bond movies. Why? Who asked for this? It, you have the simplicity and, and, and casual elegance of the original Mushnick's flower shop. It is one room, and outside there's a matte painting of a street. There's no cars, there's like a few extras walking by in some shots, but most shots don't even have that. And there's obviously no street, and it's so charming. There's something so incredibly, like, like charming about it. It has such a it's it has such charm to it. And all these wacky signs hung up around the flower shop. It it, it just screams like 
charm and atmosphere. Like this is a this is a location that Roger Corman had been to, or something similar. And he populates the Skid Row with all kinds of fun and interesting little tidbits. He makes it feel lived in. And then you have this bloated product that's shot on an this giant sound stage with an, with an entire bridge. They got this giant bridge crossing the street and they have all these old cars, all these vintage automobiles lined up to make it look like it's actually the 60s and it's, and it's a giant set and all these businesses open for business, baby. At that point, it just becomes lame. Like, if it was an original story, like Rocky Horror Picture Show, it'd be awesome. I'm not gonna lie. If it wasn't based on a Roger Corman movie, I'd totally be into it. But you can't outdo Roger Corman. You, you just, you can't take something Roger Corman made and say, well, look at this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it with a bigger budget, and more props, and more sets, and more flashy shit, and I'm gonna have Steve Martin digging into this guy's mouth, and instead of just the basic simplicity of the idea of this dentist, you know, using this crappy drill, and, you know, the patient's like, yeah, get away from me, oh, that hurts so much, you know, just a very simple shot, I'm gonna build this giant prosthetic mouth and have it open up, I'm going to have a camera view from the inside, and it's going to be this giant teeth and tongue. No. I'm your uh, it's, just, it's just so bloated. Like, the, the, mus the musical version feels so, like, overblown with this unnecessary detritus. And it's just so, so bad. I'm not going to dwell on that. The Wikipedia article for the original Little Shop of Horrors mentions how around 2009 there was mentions of a remake of Little Shop of Horrors, uh, and the, the guy who was going to make it said that he wasn't going to make it a musical version, and it was going to be a remake of the original but with a darker tone, and I think that's that would actually be worth it because I think Little Shop of Horrors could be done with a darker tone if, if, you know, if you really put yourself to it. But that version is now scrapped or in development hell or, sh or something, and instead there's going to be an, an, a new version of the musical. Why? I get off on the pain I Just make a serious version of Little Shop of Horrors. This would work. You got the funny version, you got the scary version. You don't need a musical version. That's just random and lame. And w why would you need that? You know, I, I understand that some people really are into the musical and they've seen all the songs and they've been to the show and they've watched the movie and they're like, but my little shop of horrors isn't spawn. It is. I can't watch little shop of horrors if it doesn't have all those classic songs. Don't knock it until you try it, huh? But guess what? The songs aren't classic. What's classic is the original Little Shop of Horrors, a movie that has not aged a day despite being set in 1960, a movie that was made with grit and determination and passion by Roger Flipping Corman. That's the movie you should be watching. If you like the musical and you haven't seen the original, Give the original a try. It's so good. And if you haven't seen the musical, you have escaped a terrible fate. Check out the original. You're going to enjoy it so much more than the musical. I am telling you right now, avoid the musical at all costs. It is a rancid just pile of lameness that is, is, is driving me crazy. So that's why I felt I had to make this review. There's just so many fun little bits in the original. Like when Seymour gets ambushed by the by the lady, and he, you know he's he's like, I gotta take you to Matt. Master, I gotta find food. Maybe I can help. And I just think it's so funny that the plant can hypnotize people too. It's just so random, and 
all it is is just a, just a guy under the plant being like, feed me, I want some food, I want to eat. It's such a simple concept, and it's done so well. And you will you will really enjoy the original. Check it out. That's my suggestion. And and now back to you. Hey, come on, give me some food. I'm hey, starving here. I, I, I said good food. things about feed the movie. Me. Feed me. So you, you just can't accept that I can't keep feeding you eat. any more bodies, feed okay? Me. You can accept that? Are you, hey, are, feed me. I want to eat. Look, I, I know you're getting old and withered, right okay? Now. I want to not eat. my problem. Feed I'm not going to be feed feeding me. you any more hands. I'm hungry. I need no more limbs. No more extremities, all right? I want chow now. I want to chow down now. Oh, that's how it's going to be, huh? That's how it's going to be. You want, you want some feed more, huh? Me. Feed me. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? I can't feed you feed me. anymore. We're Come on, give me some food. Out of food. food. I'm okay. Starving here. Yeah. I want some I said food. good things about feed the movie you like. Feed me. So now I just... want some chow. I'm ready to eat. What? What? What are you? What are you? What are you doing? Oh, no. There's not like... Oh. <gasps>